Southeast's Public Archaeology Coordinator. We spent the past few weeks talking about some basic intros to archaeology, learning about what archaeology is, how to do it, what stone tools are, what shell tools are, and how archaeology intersects with climate change. So this week we'll be talking about something very important for archaeologists, and that is dating. Because archaeologists will date any old thing. <laughs> Sorry. So today we'll be talking about how to figure out how old an artifact or site is. And there are two ways to do this. These are known as either relative dating or absolute dating. Relative dating is looking at change in design over time in order to figure out how old something is, while absolute dating measures the decay of carbon-14 atoms to get a more accurate range of dates, going up to 60,000 years ago. So to start with relative dating, because it is relatively simple, but not exactly, um, we can use relative dating to understand a number of different assemblages. It's actually much more accurate to use relative dating for historical archaeology in the relatively modern era than it is to use carbon-14 dating. When we talk about relative dating, we talk about the changes in design and technology over time. So when we talk about technology, we don't necessarily mean electronics or anything particularly modern. We can be talking about changes in pottery technology. We can be talking about changes in architecture. We use all of these changes over time to create a seriation which allows us to get some pretty accurate dates and time spans as to when certain sites were inhabited and when certain artifacts were being made. For example, if we look at pottery in Florida, human beings first started making pottery in Florida around 4,500 years ago, and it started off very, very thick and full of plant fiber tempers. And once again, for anyone who missed Rachel's video last week, temper is anything that you mix in with clay to make it more stable during firing. So at first, pottery in Florida was very, very thick. It was mixed with fiber tempers. And as time wore on and technology moved forward, pottery started to get thinner and thinner and thinner. And the indigenous people in Florida began to use different kinds of temper more and more often. So we start to see sponge spicules, small pieces of freshwater sponge, and we start to see sand, we even start to see limestone. Bell Glade Plain, because archaeologists are very creative when it comes to naming things, Bell Glade Plain is a undecorated pottery, which is associated with Bell Glade culture. Um, Bell Glade Plain, for example, has sand temper mixed into it, and it was able to be fired at such high temperatures that the sand inside the pottery would actually melt into glass, and part of identifying a piece of Bell Glade pottery is sort of flicking it against your ear to see if you can hear it ring. So when it comes to relative dating, we can use relative dating all through time, and sometimes it's used as a supplement to absolute dating. This can give us a few different range of dates. We can use relative dating for historic bottles. We can use relative dating for all kinds of pottery from all over the world. We can use it to track international trends in trade goods being shipped all over the world in the historic period. And minted coins are also a very useful source of information when it comes to relative dating. Finding a coin with a date stamped on it in a shipwreck can be extremely useful it can give us a much more clear range of dates for when the shipwreck may have happened, which boat it may have been, when it may have sank, all these different kinds of information. Historic bottles are also particularly useful when it comes to relative dating. There are a number of different features to look for on a bottle to figure out when it was manufactured, who it was manufactured by, and where it was manufactured. Sometimes you can look at the maker's mark on the bottom of a bottle to figure out exactly how old it is. A maker's mark is pretty much a trademark for the manufacturer of bottles. When it comes to dating historic bottles, it can be a lot more complicated than it might seem. Initially, a lot of these maker's marks are very, very similar to each other. We've been able to develop a matching game which shows exactly how frustrating it can be. 
and there are a lot of intersecting and overlapping methods of dating historic bottles. It's sort of like how often archaeologists argue about what color dirt is. It's one of those things. So when it comes to absolute dating, once again, this is a little more exact, but only within certain parameters. It can only go as far back as 60,000 years. By that point, we have to use other methods of dating. And it also gives you a sort of range of dates, typically a couple centuries to maybe 50 years or so. Um, that means that the more recent an artifact or a site is, the less accurate carbon dating will be. So you actually really have to rely on relative dating when it comes to historical archaeology. I am not a math person. I am a shovel bum and illustrator by training. So I will try to explain this in a way that will be understandable to non-math people and hopefully not too painful for math people. Essentially, all known life forms in the universe are carbon-based. When these life forms die, the carbon atoms inside of them decay at a known rate that's consistent for every kind of living thing throughout the whole universe. But this is great news for archaeologists because that means we have a consistent data set that we can measure the decay of carbon atoms into. And when we talk about carbon dating, we are talking about carbon-14 specifically. That's an isotope of carbon, a kind of unstable atom. And when carbon-14 decays, it decays into nitrogen. So essentially, when we're doing carbon dating, we're looking at how many carbon atoms are left in a small piece of a formerly alive life form. And this is based on consistent data about the half-life of carbon-14. So when you see really, really old dates in textbooks going back 10,000 years, 15,000 years, those all come from carbon dating. So how do we collect samples of carbon out in the field? Previously, we had to very, very carefully dig around any kind of piece of charcoal that we could find, because charcoal was and is the sort of holy grail for doing carbon dating. We would find a piece of charcoal in situ, that is a fancy science term for where it is in a site where it was left originally. We would find a piece of charcoal in situ, freak out, get super excited, take out our trowels, we would very, very carefully lift the charcoal out of our unit and place it into a very adorable little tinfoil house where it could be safely transported to a carbon dating lab. Usually in Florida, this happens at University of Georgia. Uh, apparently, we don't have to worry about the tinfoil houses so much anymore, but this was the traditional way of doing this for quite some time. So when we get our carbon dates back from the lab, because, as I cannot stress enough, most archaeological discoveries and rediscoveries happen in the lab while we're doing research, these come with a small range of dates. Usually it's accurate to within a couple centuries to 50 years. So again, as you can imagine, the older something gets, the smaller the range of dates it is and the more accurate it is. So, you know, once again, we really prefer relative dating for historical archaeology, more recent history, and we really prefer absolute dating or carbon-14 dating when it comes to much, much older material. So while relative and absolute dating might seem pretty straightforward in many ways, and in some ways they are, we do have a few things to consider and keep in mind when we are working with carbon dating. And the biggest one of these is the old wood problem. Basically, carbon dating shows you when an organism died and lived, not necessarily when it was used. So that means, you know, think about how much humans today love their hardwood floors. A lot of people will try to keep them and reuse hardwood for building materials. And this has been the case for thousands of years. So just because a piece of carbonized wood, which is a fancy science word for burnt wood, comes out of a site and hits a certain date range doesn't necessarily mean that's how old the site is. We have to be really careful about that because just like today, just like people 
today are really interested in architecture, in hardwood floors, in reusing prestige materials that hold up really well against the elements. People in the past were doing this for thousands of years. So in order to avoid the old wood problem, we have to pay close attention to what kind of plants we're sampling. We have to pay attention to how quickly those plants grow, how fast or slow their life cycle is, and also, of course, we have to consider where they were found in their primary context, which is why it is so very important to keep notes on absolutely everything that we do as archaeologists which we cannot stress enough here at FPAN. The difference between science and screwing around is writing it down. Another very important archaeology rule of thumb, which we're learning about today, is called when in doubt, let the lab sort it out. Uh, but the lab can't sort it out if they don't have a full picture of what was happening. So these things are especially important to consider when looking at things like shipwrecks, and when looking at what looks to be hearth areas or fireplace areas, for terrestrial sites. So if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into relative dating, the Society for Historical Archaeology has a really excellent resource on dating historic bottles, which I will link in the comments. Highly recommend checking that out because there's much more that goes into relative dating than meets the eye. I will also be linking an excellent worksheet by Project Archaeology about absolute dating with M&Ms in the comments. If you have any questions, make sure to leave those there and we will address them as quickly as we can. So once again, my name is Mallory Fenn. I am FPAN Southeast's Public Archaeology Coordinator, and I hope you tune in on Thursday at 3 p.m to see my excellent colleague Rachel Kangas give another live talk about archaeology in southwest Florida. Hope everyone is staying inside and staying safe. <laughs>